So good evening. Uh, I'm Neil Gordon. I'm CEO here at the Discovery Museum, and I want to welcome you to the first event in the 2023 Discovery Museum Speaker Series. Tonight's event, Teaching Today's Kids to Spot Tomorrow's Fake News with Susan Engel. Uh, thank all of you who have been joining us for many years and all of those of you who have joined us tonight for the first time. So before we get started, I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping. Uh, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the session tonight. So please submit your questions anytime during the presentation using the Q&A button, and we'll address as many of those questions as possible later on. You can use the chat bun button for any technical questions. Uh, closed captioning uh, can be turned on and off also with the button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who want to watch it again, we are recording tonight's presentation and a link to the recording will be sent to all the registrants once it's available. Um, so I have a little bit of business to do before we want to get started. So I want to start by thanking very much all of the speaker series sponsors. Tonight's event is free due to the support of Enterprise Bank, Sutherland, Sutherland Realty Group, and NetScout along with the other sponsors who are shown here. And thank you to all of those who, who have also made a donation in support of the series, along with your reservation for tonight's event. This year's speaker series theme is Conversation, Understanding, Hope. Now these events are intended to be conversations on topics that can be challenging for families or for anyone really. And, and uh, we hope that you will be uh, guided through these uh, conversations by informed and insightful speakers who can help bring us to understanding and through that understanding, uh, gain a hopeful perspective on the future. The upcoming events in our series are Big Tech, Big Business and the Lives of Children, A Family Revealed from Slavery to Hope, which will be our only in-person event in the series this year. Uh, another event, how to talk to kids about gun violence. And lastly, we'll, we'll wrap up with the toll of incarceration on families. We do hope to schedule a sixth event that would be on climate and kids, which will be scheduled for the fall. So stay tuned for a date for that um, um, later. I will point out that registration is open now on our website for all of these scheduled events. Now, last week, before we get started, I just want to share a few words about the museum, and then we will welcome Susan. So the Discovery Museum supports kids and families by providing play-based learning experiences that are rooted in science and nature. We create exhibits and programs that spark kids' natural creativity and curiosity and make learning fun. And we work, and in all of this, we work really hard to make sure that those, are experience, those experiences are available to every kid. We offer a range of free programs designed for families with children experiencing a disability and are proud to report that 25% of our visitors are served for free or nearly free each year. We're also the proud of our work around sustainability with ambitious goals to reduce the carbon, museum's carbon footprint. Last year, we became the first children's museum in the country to generate 100% of its electricity needs through on-site solar. We produce more electricity than we need, in fact, and we provide the excess to five other nonprofits at a discount, making, we believe, the Discovery Museum one of the largest nonprofit clean energy providers in the state. We try to do this work in a way that's visible to our visitors to help educate and inspire the next generation of Earth's caretakers. Now, we were proud to celebrate the Discovery Museum's 40th anniversary last year. And a look back at our history reaffirmed the basic principle of how we need to support kids and families for the next 40 years. We continue our work to help prepare kids to be curious and active citizens in a complex and diverse world to use their voices to stand up for themselves, truth, science, and each other, and to confront perhaps the biggest impact on their future climate sustainability. 
We'll do this work in ways that are fun, memorable, and impactful for kids and always in the Discovery Museum way. With that, I am uh, really excited and pleased that we have Susan Engel here to join us tonight. So Susan, I'd like to welcome you to click that video button and join me. There you are. It's good to see you. Nice to see you. So Susan, I'm, I'm going to bore you by reading your bio to everybody else for a second. Go right ahead. Susan Engel is, is the class of the 1959 director of the program in teaching at Williams College, where she teaches a range of courses in, psych in the psychology department, including the psychology of education and a senior seminar, which I think is interestingly titled Suckers and Scammers. She is the inaugural senior fellow to the Rice Center for Teaching. Susan holds a PhD in developmental psychology from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Susan has taught all ages from preschool to graduate school and was co-founder and educational advisor to an experimental school in New York State called the Hayground School. Now, Susan is the author of a lot of great works, but importantly, The Hungry Mind, The Origin of Curiosity in Children, and here we have it to show folks, The Intellectual Lives of Children, as well as a book for teachers entitled The Children You Teach. She's also published articles on narrative development, curriculum, and the development of children's ideas. She's currently researching how young children learn to pursue ideas and is working on a book about kindergarten in America. Susan, it's a lot of great stuff, and we're really excited to have you with us. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and, and get out of the way. It's great. Thing. Not the getting out of the way part. Um, <laughs> let me see if I did this right. Is that right? Can you see it? Hmm. There. Can you see it now? We all good? We're all good. We can okay. see it now. Here, here we go. First of all, Neil, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, that was really kind. Also, the pictures, I had already promised you that I plan to come visit the museum with my very lively, very dynamic, active uh, three-year-old grandchildren. I have two of them. Um, but seeing the pictures made me even more eager um, to come visit. So thank you for inviting me tonight and for a future visit. And I want to tell all of you who have joined us tonight how grateful I am uh, to spend this hour with you talking about the topic I care so much about. I have to admit, it's still a little weird for me to talk to my own screen and not get to see anybody. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions at the end so that I have some sense of who you are and it feels a little bit more like a conversation. But I'm gonna start actually by asking you a question. I wish I could see your faces and see your hands raised or not raised, but, um, but I'll just have to imagine it. The question is this, uh, take a moment and think what you would answer to the question, is it good to eat breakfast? And I'm going to guess that many of you readily nod to that question. Um, and that if I asked you in person, you'd raise your hand and say, yes, it's good to eat breakfast. And I was having, I was staying with a friend of mine, um, a professor actually in Massachusetts overnight. And when she offered me food in the morning, I said, no, 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 I just drink coffee. I don't wanna eat anything. And she said, but Susan, they say it's the most important meal, you must. And I remember sitting there and thinking, who are they? And what made you decide to trust them? And the reason that question occurred to me is because over the last few years, I've become increasingly aware and concerned that so many people in the United States are not discerning enough about judging the source of information or the validity of the information they hear. They don't know, most of us have trouble evaluating the truth of what we're learning or uh, the reliability of the source. And I have to admit that during COVID that concern became even worse because people were sort of throwing around information and, and there was a lot of confusing information. It was understandable. I too got confused and didn't know quite who to believe. And it increased my concern that people aren't um, equipped with the skills they need to have the kinds of, to engage in the kinds of good thinking that I think we all need. 
but I don't study grownups. I mean, except for the course I teach on suckers and scammers, but you know, ordinarily I study children. So all of that concern found its way into the area that I do research in and uh, the topic of tonight's talk, which is how can we help children become good thinkers? And I think as I continue to talk, you'll get some sense of what I mean by good thinking, but if it's not clear to you or you wanna poke at that a little more um, later, I'd be glad to answer questions about what I mean by good thinkers. Luckily, children are born with a certain set of skills or capacities that are essential for good thinking. They, they actually come equipped with the most essential elements of, of what I would call good thinking. And the first element that I wanna talk about, maybe the biggest, is uh, children's voracious curiosity. Uh, what researchers define as the need to resolve uncertainty or explain the unexpected. Now, the thing about even not newborn babies, I have a three-week-old uh, granddaughter uh, living next door to me, um, and she's too young to exhibit what I'm about to describe. But by the time children are a few years old, I mean, a few months old, uh, not a few years, a few months, they um, they have an amazing ability to detect novelty in the environment. So if you show a baby of a couple of months an image on a screen um, that they're familiar with, or you give them time to become familiar with it, uh, they will look at it, but they will quickly go back to kicking their legs or making their little noises or just lying there and gazing around them. If you change it to an object that they're unfamiliar with, a new visual scene, um, everything changes. They notice that something's different. Their heartbeat changes, the moisture they produce on their skin changes, their breathing changes, and they pay attention. That's because they know the difference between familiar and unfamiliar. And not only do they know the difference between familiar and unfamiliar, they're incredibly motivated to make the unfamiliar become familiar. And you know, that powerful uh, need to know or need to find out stays with them through the first few years of life. And anybody in the audience who has a one-year-old or a toddler or a preschooler knows just what I mean. Um, it's why researchers have described, have said that if you put a two-year-old at the doorway of uh, a room full of unfamiliar objects, they'll just tear their way through the room in no time at all, trying to find out everything they can about that environment. And it's not surprising um, that that in the first few years of life, you learn more than you will ever learn again. Um, because that voracious appetite for information is sort of driving you through your daily experience. Um, it's not always easy to have a curious baby around you. Uh, and children use every tool at their disposal to find out about the world. So they put things in their mouths, they bang things, they take things apart, they watch, they listen. Uh, they tinker as they get older, they get more and more likely to actually take things apart and look inside of them. Um, and they engage in this continually. Um, at around, it depends on your particular child, but somewhere around 18 months or, or between 18 months and two and a half years, children acquire an amazingly powerful new tool for exploring the world around them. They learn to talk. And once they learn to talk, they learn to ask questions. And questions are the power tool of curiosity because before you can talk, you can only le learn about the world that's right in front of you, the things you can put in your mouth or bang or take apart or kick um, or watch. Once you can ask questions, you can ask not only what thing, you can find, find out not only what things are, but you can begin to, learn about the things that have happened before, things that might happen in the future, things you cannot see, and you can begin to ask for reasons, why things are the way they are, how things work. You express what psychologists call epistemic curiosity, the need to seek explanations. Now, to give you some sense of how powerful question asking is in the early years of life, um, I'll describe one study by, done by Tizard and Hughes, where they recorded children in their homes just going about their daily lives. And these were children from a wide range 
of communities and socioeconomic backgrounds. So it wasn't one type of kid. And what they found is the children ask somewhere between 27 and 104 questions per hour. So the most curious children in this study were asking about two questions per minute. And if I could see you now, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you have one of those children who asks two questions per minute, because I'm sure somebody does, which is just remarkable um, in terms of the way in which it's feeding a child's mind and their capacity to think. But even the least curious child asks about one question every two minutes, which is not too shabby. They too are at getting a huge amount of information um, all the time. Now, you might think, especially if you're a parent or a grandparent or a child caregiver, that a lot of the time children are asking questions just because they like to hear themselves talk or because they like attention or they want the floor. Um, but in fact, researchers have shown the children ask their questions in a fairly discerning way. It's they make it clear that they're doing it to get information. So another researcher, Michelle Schwinard, showed that when children want to know about something and someone doesn't give, in, give them a satisfying answer, they keep asking the same question. They persevere because they really want to satisfy their curiosity. And when they do get a satisfying answer to their question, in fact, they either turn to some other activity, they're satisfied, they know it, they found out what they wanted to and they can move on, or they begin to ask different questions about the same topic. They go a little deeper or they go a little wider in the kinds of information they're trying to collect. So they're quite discerning. Now, to show you what I mean about the wide range of questions that children, uh, the wide range of curiosities that children can satisfy with their questions. I'm gonna show you this, something this strange, let me see, there. Um, show you this slide uh, of a conversation that I recorded. So this little girl said to her mom, why the dog poops outside? And the mother said, because that's what animals do. And the child said, why don't we poop outside? And the mother said, because we're people. And the child said, but you said people were animals. And the mother said, yeah, but people have houses. But this is Lucky's house too, right? Yes, but even so, Lucky's a dog. But they don't like to poop in a toilet? And the mother said, I don't know, Lucky's never tried it. And the child said, but he might like it, right? Now, this is a wonderful example of a very common occurrence, which is a mother and a child talking about something where the child's trying to understand something. She's trying to get her mind around something. And she's incredibly persevering she sticks with it. She's trying to get at something. This mother was happy to answer her, but not quite sure what she was answering. And the child has the kind of, um, what would you say, the tenacity and the skill of a first-rate prosecuting attorney. She wants to get to know what she wants to know. And she's very resourceful in doing it. Uh-oh. Oh, there. Um, so this is another example that gives you a sense of a different kind of curiosity a small child by, might have. And I actually witnessed this. I was on a plane and there was a three-year-old girl in front of me with her mom. And the little girl had her face smashed up to the window of the airplane. And she was looking down at the ground, which you could still see. We were at that point in the, in the flight. And she suddenly said to her mom, mommy, there's probably a little kid down there asking her mommy if there is a kid up here in a plane. And is her mommy going to say, yes, there is a child up there? Now, I find this to be a wonderful example of how um, abstract and complex the ideas are that even very young children are tussling with. As I said, they don't only want to know what things are called or what time they're going uh, to the park or whether they can hold the glass of juice or not hold the glass of juice. They are trying to understand things, things like um, simultaneous experience from different perspectives, which is what this question is about. And we know from a broad range of data that it's not, the, it's not just a few kids that do this. It's a common feature of um, early life. Uh, although the fate of that curiosity, well, I'll tell you about that a little later. Um, but I want to give you um, 
one more example uh, to show that children not only ask about complex things, they ask about weighty things, difficult things. So this comes from a wonderful uh, data bank online um, called the Child is Data Bank, where ch children uh, were recorded over a wide range of circumstances over days and days, and in some cases, months or years, and researchers have access to that data bank. Um, so this little girl was four and she was playing with some toys and she had just heard uh, that her pet had died. And her mother said, and he got himself ready to die, Laura. He took his nest down and he knew he was dying and he got himself ready. And the child said, he knew he was dying. And the mother says, yes. And the father said, he knew. And the child said, how did he know he was dying? And the mother says, he could feel inside. And the father said, a feeling in the air. And the little girl says, I don't wanna die. And the mother says, mm, we're not going to. And later on that same day, the child was playing by herself and was recorded saying as she played, saying out loud, I wonder what it feels like to be dead. Um, in my most recent book, I actually devote a whole section to children's interest in uh, idea, complex ideas, and one of them is death. And it turns out in some recent data that I've collected that it's a very common topic for for children um, to be interested in. And in that, in those data that I collected, what we found out is that um, how, how capable children are of sustained interest in a topic. They pursue it not just over a few minutes or a few hours, but over days and months. They might bring up the topic again and again, or they might bring it up a lot for a week and then not bring it up, but bring it up uh, again, two months later. So in fact, it's um, not unusual for children to be interested in this. I'm glad to answer questions later about some of the other topics that we now learned children have that kind of sustained curiosity about. So what is it, what are the circumstances, you might be wondering if you're a teacher or a parent, what are the circumstances that promote these kinds of um, curious, searching kinds of exchanges or um, dialogues between children and the people who care for them. Well, in the study by Tizard and Hughes that I mentioned before, where they recorded all the kids at home, um, they found that the, the longest, richest conversations were happening, let me see, I have a slide, um, when mother and child, in their study, they were looking mostly at mothers, when mother and child were doing nothing in particular. So that the, it wasn't when they were working on a, a project together and it wasn't when they were doing tasks and it wasn't when the mother was trying to teach the child to do something, it's when they were just hanging out. And the way that I would describe that, and I think it has real significance for schools, is that ideas love leisure. And a lot of the most important intellectual work uh, happens during moments of rest and, and leisure. So we know from research that children have a voracious appetite for information. Um, and we know that um, they use the tools at their disposal. They use their hands, their eyes, their ears, their mouth, their feet, and also their words uh, to seek information. But they're also quite discerning at judging the source of spoken information, of things that they're told, what is referred to in the um, literature as testimony. Uh, so in one wonderful example of research on this topic, um, Melissa Koenig and her colleagues uh, brought children, four-year-old children, one at a time uh, into a room, sitting at a little table, looking at a screen on which were projected two adults, one in a red shirt and one in a blue shirt. And between the two adults uh, was an object, first a ball, then a cup, then a book. And each time an object, a familiar object, was placed in front of the child, one of those grown-ups said, oh, ball, it's called a ball. And the other grown-up said, used the wrong name, said it's a shoe, even though it was a ball. And again, when the cup was put in front of the child, the same grown-up who had said it was the first thing was a ball said about the cup, it's a cup. And the other grown-up said, oh, that's a dog. And same with the book. So they were given some experiences of a reliable and an unreliable um, source of information. In the next phase of the experiment, those same children 
were still sitting at the table and still those two same grownups in their red shirt and their blue shirt. And the child was presented one at a time with a completely unfamiliar object, something they had no way of checking. A colorful woven bamboo object, a white bulbous rubber object, who knows what that was, and a red textured paper object. Each time one of those unfamiliar objects was placed in front of them, the grown-up who had given the accurate names of, of things in the first place would call it a toma, and the other person would call it a mito. And with the second, a wug or a dax, and with the red paper object, a blicket or a donu. Then the adults were quiet, and the experimenter said to each child, what is this, and held up the bamboo object. The children were incredibly good at realizing that they should trust the grown-up who had given the accurate names to the first set of objects. In other words, children rely, trust and believe and learn from reliable grown-ups. And they know how to decide who's reliable based on their, um, their skill uh, at naming things that they already knew. So this is just one example of a wide body of research that shows that early on, children are quite discerning. Um, now, I wanna talk for a few minutes about uh, why this matters. Well, it turns out that the amount of talk and the length of conversations that children have when they're very young predicts a whole lot of really important measurable uh, benefits later on. So children who have long conversations at home and cover a wide range of topics uh, find it easier to learn to read when they get to school. They also know a lot more information, which we are increasingly realizing is a, an element in learning to read, that the more things you know, the easier it is to break the reading uh, system. We also know that children who have parents who ask and answer what and how questions have children who two years later are more able to re reason in complex ways. So the more reasons reasoning that you engage in with your parents when you're little in terms of how questions and why questions, uh, the more able you were you will be to engage in even more complex reasoning a few years later. You might think that because curiosity is sort of the engine of learning, uh, it motivates kids to learn. They learn easily when they wanna know information. They have this arsenal of skills for getting the information about things they're curious about. You would think that it's the sort of, um, it's the bread and butter of schools. However, unfortunately, that's not the case. At least it's not the case in most schools where researchers, including me, have done our work. So Tizard and Hughes, the researchers I mentioned already, uh, when they followed the very same children who asked as many as 104 questions per hour, when they followed those children into their schools in the first few years of schooling, they found that the frequency of question asking per child dropped from somewhere between 27 and 104, the number I mentioned before, to about three or four questions per hour. So that's a dramatic drop in the expression of curiosity in a school setting. Um, when I and my students research compared kindergarten and fifth grade um, classrooms to see whether there were differences between those two grades, well, we expected we were gonna look at things like gender differences or differences between the block corner and the lunch table or the math corner and the reading corner. In fact, we couldn't identify the individual differences we had expected um, because there were so few questions being asked in any of the classrooms either kindergarten or fifth grade. Uh, and I, when, when I say so few, I mean in kindergarten classrooms that we observed, the high would have been about seven questions per hour. And that was across 23 children. In some of the fifth grade classrooms we visited, we didn't hear any questions at all. Um, we know from some more recent research by, um, by Post and Vandermolen, that when you interview grade school children about what kinds of things they're curious about and where they're able to pursue that curiosity, they don't mention school. They do have things they're interested in, but they're not things that they think uh, belong in school or that they can pursue in school. Um, meanwhile, I wanna just mention something that sort of 
a, another puzzle piece here, which is I told you the children, young children are very good at discerning who to trust and who not to trust, who, who knows something and is gonna share that knowledge with you. By the time they're six, they've given up a little of that uh, careful discernment based on accuracy or a display of, um, of knowledge or skill. Uh, they're more likely to trust someone they feel close to. Uh, so that's an example of a, a strand of development where children shift their behavior in a way that might make them actually less able to judge reliable and unreliable information. So we're stuck with a, a puzzle here, which is why is something that is so powerful and voracious, um, omnivorous in early life, why does it seem to dwindle and why is it so hard to find in a school setting? And I just wanted to make an additional point, which is if you're thinking about schools and the way in which they might encourage or discourage curiosity, um, and these come from some school kindergartens I visited. And I've been going around the country visiting kindergartens, and these pictures come from such a, some of the kindergartens that I visited. Um, it's not a matter of kids getting to do hands-on activities or having to sit at a desk versus and and do a paper and pencil activities. That's not the difference between the curious classrooms and the less curious classrooms. Um, it has to do with how much the activity is generated by the children and how much the teacher is sort of um, fostering and encouraging the child's own quest for knowledge, which is what children luckily get when they are at home. Okay, so I've been talking so far about um, sort of question asking and the kind of curiosity that children ex express in the moment. But children gather information and express their curiosity in other ways too, um, often by engaging in collecting or collections. And there are a lot of ways to collect. There are a lot of things you can collect. It's something else I talk about in my most recent book. Um, they collect information about a particular topic. They might collect bugs. They might collect stones. They might collect cars. Um, my three-year-old grandson is obsessed with trucks and wants to know everything about them. And he's not just collecting the trucks. He's collecting names and knowledge and information about, about those things that he collects. Meanwhile, there's another key capacity in good thinking that is emerging early in life. And I'm gonna spend a little bit less time talking about it only because I, I wanna make sure there's time for questions, but I wanna give you um, a flavor of it. That is when children aren't inquiring about the world, they're inventing. They're using what they know and the materials around them to, to answer, pro to solve problems. And often inventions involve putting together known elements in an unusual way or using an element, a tool that you've used for one purpose in a new purpose. And we all know that from our own efforts to invent, whether it's in the kitchen or the garage um, or you know, at, at our desk. But he's, here are three examples of children engaged in invention. Um, on, on, I guess it's on your left too, I'm not sure, uh, is uh, music from a classroom where children were invited to compose their own music. Um, and that's certainly a wonderful example of early invention. Uh, the outdoor picture under the pine tree is from a school in Oregon where kids spent a significant amount of their time um, building forts outside. And forts are another wonderful example of the way in which early on, long before children can work in a sophisticated grown-up way in a lab, for instance, or an engineering room, uh, they can invent using old materials in a new way. And then at the bottom is a, is a very familiar kind of invention. Children invent with their drawing. Here's uh, just a one picture of a group of children in a classroom that I was uh, observing in who spent almost all their time inventing. They, in fact, they entered contests for inventions, science contests, and uh, they spent a huge amount of their times inventing and working with gadgets. Um, and the green notebooks are interesting because, and I'm gonna come back to this, they had to keep track of their thinking process. Uh, so a key piece of invention in this case is learning how to think about your own thoughts and learning how to track um, your own process of invention. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on 
I think I have a picture for this. Yeah, to some other features of early life that are, are there naturally, but depend on being encouraged to be brought out in their full strength. So these are things all virtually all typically developing children can do and naturally do, but whether they bring those to bear on, on serious topics as they get older is to some extent or to a great extent uh, a function of the adults around them and whether the adults foster these. And I'm just gonna mention um, a few of them. So one, I I've just begun to hear my own three-year-old grandchildren, their cousins, and they live right next door to each other and right next door to me. So I hear them talk a lot. Um, is around that age, children begin to mark the difference between think and know. And we know from previous research that having being around grownups who talk about knowledge, about thinking, and even use the word idea, um, are promoting those processes in their young children. But children try to market themselves. They say, I thought it was gonna be a chocolate, but I didn't know it was actually gonna be a cherry candy. So it's very simple, it's very casual. It happens in the car, it happens in the bathroom, uh, the, the sort of marking of think versus know, but it reflects a fundamental intellectual capacity, which is the capacity to know the difference between what you're speculating about and what you take to be a matter of fact. Um, right along with that is a really wonderful new burgeoning area of research amongst developmental psychologists, which is children's ability to track their own uncertainty, to know the difference between when they feel confident that something is true and when they're not sure and they want to test it further. Um, and it goes with what I've been saying so far, children have a great need to test the certainty of what they know. They want to do that. Whether they go on doing that or not as they get older is a matter of, of environment. Um, a third capacity that I want to mention in, in this context is uh, children's ability to think counterfactually, to begin to ask themselves, well, if I had done it this way, if I had rolled the ball, if I dropped the ball from the top of the stairs instead of the bottom of the stairs, would it have, it probably would have gone down faster. If I had not worn my boots, um, my feet would have gotten wet. Uh, if I hadn't eaten all the candy, you can see what I'm thinking about, um, I wouldn't have a tummy ache uh, and so forth and so on. And, you know, speaking as a, a professor, uh, everything we do, uh, certainly in science and in a lot of other fields, certainly history is about uh, thinking about counterfactuals. Um, so encouraging children to do that, they, they have the natural capacity to do it when they're very young, but whether they go on doing that and make it a habit and a disposition uh, is another matter. And then finally, children are remarkably capable of, um, of engaging in thought experiments. So in a beautiful study, uh, two researchers showed children a complicated rigmarole of tubes and uh, places where a ball could go down and then go to one side or the other and then come out at the bottom. And though children originally assumed the ball would come out near where they dropped it, once they were invited to think about it and look at the contraption and think about where the ball might go, they actually correctly predicted where it would really go, not where they assumed it would go. And they did that without seeing the ball go down. Not everything is a matter of experience. Plenty of things are just a matter of engaging in thought experiments. Okay, I wanna bring it back um, to uh, the beginning and, the, and my mention of uh, question asking. And, but now I wanna talk about what we could do at home and in classrooms to encourage these kinds of higher level thinking. Uh, one thing we can do is actually encourage rather than discourage children from arguing. Argument is at the heart of higher order thinking, uh, thinking about something from one perspective and then encountering a different perspective, trying to see what uh, an idea would be like if you changed what you knew about it or how you, how you approached it. And research by Deanna Kuhn has shown that when children um, engage in argument in school, and it's a part of the curriculum, 
uh, their, their capacity to think in complex ways, to think critically, exponentially grows. Um, in fact, in one beautiful study, I'm going to forget the woman's name. Oh, her name is Carrie uh, and, um, and Winner. They had one set of children, several small groups, engage in a regular philosophy class. In, and this was at the end of elementary school, not in high school. And the other children learned things, the other groups, but it wasn't based on a sort of argument and philosophy. The children who engaged in the philosophy classes, even when they were quite young, uh, were much more able to solve a variety of critical thinking skills at the end of that curriculum. Um, and so that's just another example of um, of the kinds of conversation and argument that are essential. I mean, I would say, I didn't say it earlier, but I'm gonna say it now, that if I could make one change to schools right now, it would be to make conversation the center of the curriculum. Because we know from all the research I've described that conversation is at the heart of intellectual development early on. And yet in schools, we don't see enough of it. And it's an amazingly underused uh, piece of the curriculum and an amazingly underused um, kind of learning material because it's free. And it doesn't, it, it's right there in every classroom where there are grownups and children. Uh, and we would do well to fan the flames of it rather than uh, to keep it at the sidelines. It's not just for recess. It's not just for lunch. It's not just for the end of the day. And I'm gonna end my comments. Uh, these are my two grandchildren or two of my grandchildren um, by suggesting something because I don't know who you are and I don't know what brought you to this talk um, that engaging, encouraging curiosity, encouraging invention, encouraging children to pursue their ideas and to argue is very good for each individual child. It makes each child a more capable and more discerning thinker. But even if you don't have children or grandchildren, um, a society that's comprised of people who are good thinkers is better for everybody. That's the end of my formal comments. Uh, I'd love to hear questions. Susan, thank, thanks, thanks a lot for that. That was Welcome. A, a, a great summary. And, and I think people are out there um, have probably learned a lot. So there, we have a bunch of, a bunch of questions that have, okay. that have come in. Um, you know, one of the first ones was you know, around the, some of the schools that you've been visiting and, and looking at kindergartens. You know, which, the question is, are, you know, are they typical schools or have you noticed differences in curiosity levels between different types of schools like Montessori or Reggio or nature outdoor schools or, or, or the like? Well, it's a great question. And whoever asked that, I wish you'd come talk to me because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to write in this book. I'm still engaged in the visits and I have, I'm going all over the country. And, and so I say to myself every day, what am I going to put in this book? So thank you for that uh, question. All the schools that I'm visiting are public schools. Um, and, and I just had to make some sort of selection and that's the selection I chose because my, you know, the vast majority of children in this country go to public schools. Uh, and that's who I'm interested in for this, for this particular book. Um, I haven't visited any Reggio Emilia book, uh, schools for this project because it's so rarely in public schools. Um, I have seen a lot of Reggio Emilia schools. I love them. And, um, and I would say that in general, you certainly see a lot more uh, opportunity for kids to pursue what interests them and to tinker with materials and to, uh, I didn't have time to go into it tonight, but we know that when children are encouraged to do something unexpected with objects and deviate from the lesson plan, um, they gain a lot and they develop their power, their capacity uh, to acquire knowledge. So I, that's, not in any book I've read, but I, I mean, written, but I would say, yes, Reggio Emilia is a friend to curiosity. Um, I have seen some public schools that are Montessori schools, and uh, there are a lot of wonderful things about them, but um, in their most structured classical form, there isn't a lot of opportunity for kids just to muck around with things. Uh, and so, you don't see that same kind of activity in those settings. So that's sort of 
I'm not going to put that in the book, um, <laughs> but I will answer the question slightly differently aside from particular models. Uh, children all over the country are the same. It's remarkable how much, how much five-year-olds have in common, wherever they are from and wherever they've grown up. Um, but what varies a lot is the classroom environment. And yes, I see a lot of variation in the classroom environment. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And, and, and so also sort of maybe related to sort of the environment they grow up in, somebody asks that you've talked about children, you know, trusting adults that they've determined to be reliable. What happens when that reliable adult is not telling them the truth? Well, so that's that's the question. That's what I started with with my breakfast story, which is that we all encounter information all of the time um, that uh, turns out not to be reliable. It might be because the person isn't reliable, or it might be because the person's misinformed. Or you know, take mask wearing. I I told the hosts of tonight's talk that I I took my 98 year old mom to the doctor today. And the doctor said, well, we now know that masks don't protect you, so there's no point. And I was very shocked to hear that information. And I now have, and this is where I might have an advantage over the typical six-year-old and over some, uh, some grown-ups, which is, I don't know what to believe now. I don't know who to believe. And so I'm gonna do a deep dive into the most current research about masking. So I I'm not gonna offer an opinion about masking, but just, that um, there are all kinds of reasons why a source of information might be unreliable, which is why we have to be so, I, 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 this word is usually used in a negative way and I don't mean it in a negative way. It's the scientists in me. We have to be skeptics all the time. You have to say, you know, who told you that? How did they learn that? Uh, where, what makes this information true or not true, trustworthy or not? And you can't do it all the time. You know, I don't, I don't question whether my car is going to turn on every time I get in it. Um, we, we do decide that there are certain sources we trust more than others. That's sort of the only way we can get through the day. But yes, Neil, to your question. There are a lot of children, and as I said, as children move from early childhood to sort of school age, they're more likely to trust the people they feel attached to and less likely to be skeptical, even when that person tells them something that they might be, um, that they might be inclined to be skeptical of, but then their attachment to the person overrides that. And that's just all the more reason why it's the job of teachers and parents um, to, to encourage that form of skepticism. It's exhausting, but it's also essential. Yeah, so what, what is funny, uh, one of our, our uh, audience asked sort of, sort of almost the follow-up to that of, you know, sometimes um, you've, you've, you're helping kids understand that while what they may have gotten was bad information, it maybe was shared with good intentions. That you know that the that the teller didn't really know, right? That what what they were saying was the case, and so it gets it, it gets very complicated pretty quickly there, doesn't you it? You know, it's very interesting. It's a wonderful point to make because I guess I haven't thought this before, so I'm not sure I'll agree with myself even ten minutes from now. But um, I think one of the problems there is the word bad, uh, right. and I I use it. I'm sure I use that. That's bad information, but the the better maybe that burdens it with a moral value that gets in the way of the healthy kind of skepticism and lots of good information turns out not to be true later on you know we learn all the time in science that something that that scientists thought to be true or that research revealed at one time then we refine we revise um and so i suppose the the that might be better, it might be a good thing for teachers to do and parents to say, well, that information was inadequate or, or that's not even the right word, inaccurate, uh, yeah. or we've learned something new. Um, just so that children learn, not that it's bad as in bad intentions or someone was trying to fool you or someone was trying to pull one over on you, but just that 
you know, uh, it's not always easy to know what the truth is. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, have, we, have, we have one person, you know, who probably has a, a question that, you know, you could, you could fill in the blank here, um, that their nine-year-old tends to uh, use YouTube as a primary source yeah. of information. You know, how, you know, and, and you could fill in YouTube or TikTok or whatever right. social media site you, you wanted to say. And, you know, that's, it's just tons of people's opinions and things. How do you, how are we going to help kids sort through what, what's, you know, you know, when I, when just, I grew up, if you wanted to know what was true, you went to the encyclopedia and you probably had to go to the library to get to it. Right. That's really interesting. Uh, it's really, that would make a great essay uh, about whether struggling to get information pushes you to evaluate the source of information. That would be a beautiful study. Uh, so thank you for that good idea. I think I'll try to get a student interested <laughs> in that uh, for a thesis. Um, but I do think that uh, YouTube and TikTok and my, I mean, just, you know, um, I, my poor mom, I'm sort of using her tonight as my 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 blank page. Uh, she is amazingly adept with uh, technology, but she's always saying, I Googled it and I'll say, well, what site did you look at? And she'll say, Google, what do you mean? So it's hard for all of us, especially those of us who are not native to, to contemporary technology, um, to, um, to figure out how to suss out uh, the reliability of information that we get through the internet. And it just makes it all the more urgent that people talk about this with kids. Like, how do you decide which YouTubes to believe? I mean, how come we aren't talking about that? They will bring so much information and passion and energy if they had a chance in school to talk about how they decide which YouTubes to watch. Um, so it's, a, it's the, again, it's free curriculum there. Uh, have kids discuss how they evaluate the reliability of the things they watch uh, through the internet because and it's it's essential to talk about it. There isn't a simple, you know, heuristic or rubric for for deciding what's reliable and what's not reliable. And sometimes the craziest ideas turn out to be true, right? So it's not just about what makes sense. Uh, it's a complicated process evaluating information, uh, but at least we can help children become alert to the to the problem it poses for them. Yeah, certainly that that skill, you know, the, the 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 constant question answering is is like a skill that can be applied, you know, throughout life. In Absolutely. That, you know, Absolutely. You know, just the challenge is is to figure out when you stop asking asking why um, enough to, to for it to make to make sense. You know, one of the things I'll just add there, one of the things that I think is really important to have, there, a lot of people talk about the wonder of encouraging curiosity in kids and we should encourage them to pursue what they're interested in. And I agree with that, but it's not enough. So one of the things you can help kids do in school is evaluate when they are satisfied with what they've learned when they can move on, when they know enough about something for whatever purpose they're trying to know it. Um, and evaluating, you know, as a, again, as a, scholars have to do this all the time. Have I done enough on this topic? Did I answer my question? And that's something that can be cultivated in school. Right. So um, there, there were a couple of questions here around kind of a, 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 a different aspect of sort of finding truth. And that's about helping kids figure out who is a good friend and who is not and how how you can how discernment skills help you in sort of understanding yeah. you know a good friend from a friendly frenemy or whatever they would call them and you know how and are there ways to do that at different ages I can see that you've got that wow that's a great question look on your face I, I do but also it pulls up my heartstrings because I I'm a mom and now a grandma and when you watch your children try to figure out who's a good friend and who's not, or who's not a, a loving friend or a generous friend, it's sort of um, painful. Um, I, it's not my area of expertise, uh, sort of social relations, and I don't want to step. I don't want to be an unreliable source 
for this <laughs> audience. Uh, but I will give the same old answer, which is one thing you can do is talk about it. You know, uh, the, I once, uh, for another project at Williams, I wanted to make this neon sign uh, that said, um, how is it? Oh, it was going to be good. To, uh, talk is cheap, which is an old hackneyed phrase. But then I was going to have lights come on that said good and not good talk is not cheap. So mm -hmm. cultivating good talk about things that matter, like how you decide who's your friend and how you figure out which friends to keep and which friends to get some distance from. One thing everybody can do is talk about it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, around your around your um, point about, you know, wishing that schools and, and, and probably museums and other places would focus more on conversation. We, we get a great question from my buddy Willard, who says, you know, how do you ensure that there's equity and access uh, when when dominant personalities can really take over a dis an open discussion and you know an open conversation and like how how do, how do you help kids sort of make sure they're part of the conversation? That's a great, uh, really great question. So um, that's why we need good teachers, um, and why it's so hard to be a good teacher. It's harder than being a good brain surgeon and just as important um, because the good teacher is not only sort of attuned to who's talking a lot, who's dominating, who's hanging back, uh, but even more important, and I've, I've talked about this when I give workshops to school in schools, um, a lot of good teachers record what they're doing so that they can be objective. I, I don't have time to tell you tonight about an experiment I did once where we were measuring teachers' encouragement of curiosity. I'll tell you the quick um, summary though. Teachers, even the, whether they did or didn't encourage curiosity, they all thought they did. It, it's, you don't know whether you're giving everybody a chance to talk, pursue what they're interested in, have a turn in the argument. Um, so good teachers need to record themselves and then look at it objectively or get someone else to look at it because then they can begin to figure out which kids they need to sort of bring up to the front. Um, that's an interest, that's a, just a really interesting idea. And in fact, um, you know, so we've got a couple of questions from, from educators in the audience that sort of go to the, to the other side of that. Why do you think that so many classrooms suppress creativity and curiosity? In conversation is it is it is it a bureaucratic thing is it hard to do what's the oh my know, god the... i need about 10 more hours to answer that question i mean they, there are a lot of things that uh sort of factors that that converge to make it so hard to to foster those in schools i wrote a book about this it's called the end of the rainbow um it has to do with our thinking of school as a place to prepare workers who contribute to the gross national product, or at least to allowing a kid. And I don't, I shouldn't be so uh, scornful of it because everybody wants their kids and everybody else's kids to earn a decent living. But to the extent that that has shaped our educational model, uh, it has pushed us away from thinking of school as a place where you become educated, which is not exactly, I mean, if you're educated, you're much more likely to earn a living. We know that from a lot of work by economists. Um, so it's not that I'm discarding the importance of earning a living, but if the goal of school is to educate rather than to prepare people for work, you get a much bigger bang for your buck. Um, but that's not the way that our schools are organized and it's not any one person's fault. It's about a hundred years. I mean, I, like I said, I wrote about it in my book, The End of the Rainbow. It's about a hundred years of tinkering and changing until suddenly we had a, a something of a beast. So at, at the risk of asking my own question, I, I, <laughs> I, I you know, I, I, try to avoid, I try to avoid this, but to, to your point there about what the purpose of, of education has been, uh, you know, I've been reading about, you know, the, the impact of artificial intelligence on, 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 on the future and that how what we're going to need, we need to educate our kids to be even more human. That, that in fact, what will distinguish 
them in the future from the machine that can do the job yeah. is is there is the human elements of curiosity and and discernment and all of those skills that the machines will never be as good at. They they'll never be people. Uh, they'll they'll be good calculators, um, but they won't be people. And you know, do you do you think you know you know your 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 interest in in more conversation and getting and teaching kids to be great thinkers is actually an idea that might be just the next evolutionary step for 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 education. That's a hopeful question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I yeah I and I have to in I'm trying to um, walk the walk, not just talk the talk. <laughs> the true answer is I don't know, yeah. and I'm very aware of my own uncertainty. So. Uh, I just don't know the answer to that question. I don't even know if computers can be curious or not. Yeah. Um, so last question from a, a, an excited person out there. Yeah. Um, when do you expect your kindergarten book to come out? Oh my God, I love that question. Thank you. Um, uh, probably not for about a year and a half. Um, the publishing process, getting something from uh, my page, my computer to a, a bound copy is a, it's a long, arduous process. Um, but I'm thrilled uh, that anybody would even ask me that question. Uh, I'm very excited about it. I've never had so much fun uh, doing the research for a book before. I uh, just love it. Well, I wouldn't mind a job where, my, where I got to go to kindergarten every day. I, you know. um, I will tell you, it's fun when you go to a good kindergarten. It can be painful <laughs> when you go to a kindergarten that doesn't seem that welcoming to kids. I love five-year-olds, it turns out. Really love them. So. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. Susan, so on behalf of all those people out there that you cannot see, um, I want to I want to thank you for tonight. Um, this has been really great. Uh, for all of those people who, who are out there, I just remind you that a link to the recording is going to get emailed to you um, reasonably soon. Uh, and, and importantly, you'll get almost immediately from us a survey about tonight. And we hope you will fill that out and please check out the rest of the speaker series. So on behalf of the museum, uh, thank you for tuning in and, and good night. And Susan, once again, thank you. Lovely to talk to you. Bye. Bye-bye.